when something goes wrong in somebody's life or somebody needs life change, you get down and pray to God. You don't get down and pray to a York 45 pound plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, there's bigger, there's bigger issues in a barbell. The barbell has been amazing experience for all of us. It's, it's a tool, but there's just so much more that's so much more important and bigger in life and, and pursuing those things that can give you peace of heart. Welcome to the Built to Last podcast, a community for coaches founded on the principles encourage, equip, and empower. We are performance coaches working for eternal purpose. Now, here are your co-hosts, Charlie Ray and Justin Ventavania. Hey guys, welcome back to Built to Last. We have been excited to get this one to you for a while. On this episode, we are speaking with Coach Tim McClellan of the Arizona Arsenal Soccer Club. Um, one person that, I mean, is going to make you better from the moment you start listening to him and to the moment you finish is Coach Tim McClellan. And this episode was lights out, start to finish. It's just takeaway after takeaway. Um, just learning about who Coach McClellan is as a person. I mean, you can just take so much from it. And, and so we're excited to get to the show. I uh, want to read you the bio on Coach Tim McClellan really quick, guys, just so you can see how much he has accomplished in this field uh, over the past 40 plus years as a strength and conditioning coach. Tim McClellan has enjoyed a long, blessed career in the performance enhancement field. Among those he coached are more than 200 NFL players, 14 Olympic gold medalists, over a dozen NCAA individual champions, nine NCAA team champions, more than 200 NCAA All-Americans and national champions of 17 different sports. Tim also coached at Arizona State University for 13 years and has worked with the USA Olympic wrestling team, the, U the world champion USA powerlifting team, and the Boston Bruins. He was honored by the National Strength and Conditioning Association as a recipient of their President's Award. A multiple national champion himself in karate do, Tim holds black belt ranks in five different martial arts. He has authored and co-authored eight books, over 40 magazine articles, and produced 17 instructional videos and DVDs. Coach, thank you for joining us. My pleasure to join you. I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing with your ministry here, and it's an honor to be asked to be a part of it. Thank you. Absolutely. We're, we're honored to have you, Coach. And um, just to give our listeners just a brief rundown of how me and you got to know each other. So uh, I actually heard you on the Samson Strength Coach Collective podcast and was absolutely blown away by it. One of my favorite podcasts I've ever heard. Um, and I've listened to a lot of podcasts. So I just want to encourage our listeners, um, if you haven't checked it out yet, if you want to type in on iTunes or Spotify, Samson Strength Coach Collective, Tim McClellan, uh, go ahead and check that out. Um, from there, my our men's soccer coach at Hofstra actually traveled out to Arizona and met Coach McClellan put us in contact and um, the rest is history. But so thank you again for coming on coach. If you don't mind just um, sharing with our listeners a little bit on your background and strength and conditioning um, and how you've created such an amazing uh, career with longevity uh, over the last 40 plus years. You know, like, like a lot of people within the field, I um, just really had a passion for athletics when I was a young kid and I just wanted to be a great athlete. And, and unfortunately I was not given the genes that some other people have been given and um, you know, for me to be a high level athlete, I needed divine intervention. And, and God blessed me with a coach in my life named Tom Flipovitz. Coach Flip, I was 148 pounds as a junior in high school, 200 as a senior and 230 the year after that. And uh, there was a lot of time spent in the weight room and a lot of, a lot of extra eating ham sandwiches and things back in the day to try to get there, but he changed my life. And I, I saw the power of what strength and conditioning could do for athletes. And um, I just absolutely loved it. And I think it was my calling um, because back then, there's a lot of colleges back then in, in the early eighties that did not have strength and conditioning coaches at all mm -hmm. and major colleges. And so uh, I decided I was gonna pursue this and um, everything's, you know, it's been a real blessed career. Amen. Um, so coach, we have a lot of coaches now who are uh, just getting into the field and they are listening to podcasts like this. I mean, if you could speak into the younger generation, what would you say has helped you uh, create a legacy in this field? I know you've been honored by the NSCA with their president's award and um, a bunch of other accolades. What, what would you share to the younger strength coach? Um, 
remember why you're in the field. You're, you're in it to serve. And it's not about your individual pursuit of things. It's not about championships. It's not about numbers. It's not about, you know, did the team's bench press go up on average 15 pounds this quarter? It's about serving others. You know, be into it for the right reason. If you're going to serve properly, you're going to do everything you can to make yourself as good as you can be so that you can better serve others. So I would say service is at the top of my list. I would say life balance. I did a poor job of that, admittedly. Um, very, very guilty because everything for me back in the day was about conquest. So um, I would say let's have life balance. And, and really, you know, Justin, it, it's no different than what you prescribe for your athletes. You know, when you go, you want to do it better than everybody else has done it. Mm-hmm. When it's time to rest, you want to do that better than other people have done it. So, uh, you know, we need to kind of follow our own advice lo- along those lines, I think, to be the best we can be. It's interesting, like the balance between he's talking about excellence, right? Excellence in, ser- in serving and then also excellence in this other idea of resting and, and, and being balanced between the two. And I just feel like that's such an example of the struggle that we have as, as Christians, that we we're trying to strive for excellence for God's kingdom. And yet we're not trying to do it in our own strength, but resting in the power of the Holy spirit. And that's kind of like the tension I'm, I'm hearing from you is kind of like, you feel like there's been times where you necessarily haven't done that to the best of your ability. So, I mean, young strength coaches and I'm one of them. I mean, we need that. We need to hear that from some of these older veterans that have been in the field. They know how to long last for a long time. And they're saying balance is the key and make sure you know your why serving. Well, there's two things that, that come to mind, um, Charlie, if, if I can add to it. Number yeah. one, God did a lot of work. He created this world in six days. What are you doing on the seventh day? He rested. Yeah. Six. He worked six, which is 85% of the time, and he rested 15% of the time. We're called to be more godlike, so you know we need that rest. Um, I had a real life example, which was you know just a blessing in my life. And Neus Williams, who's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, would would be outworked by no one. I mean, literally, this is this is not embellished at all. We had Aeneas doing a ladder drill where he went through a speed ladder, and we asked our athletes to take a little burst out of the ladder. Our little burst was five yards. I saw him run 85 yards after a ladder. <laughs> he did the rest on his own. Aeneas was actually an ordained minister as well. And what Aeneas would do is Aeneas would work for five or six weeks. And then he'd say, hey, I won't see you next week. I'm going to the Bahamas. Wow. He worked. He outworked everybody when he worked. And he outrested everybody when he rested. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one way to do it. Just go to the Bahamas for your, for your off week. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, interesting. Let's go back for a second too. I like how you're breaking down the data on the biblical creation. Yeah, I've never week. heard of that so, breaking down that detailed. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should just do our strength and conditioning periodization with 85% work and 15% rest. That's that's like holy periodization right there. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> love well, it. Let- um, so, coach, so so shifting back into the professional a bit. So, I know recently, um, or maybe you can actually fill me in a little bit how recently it was, but you had transitioned into the private sector. I know you've spoken a little bit about that on previous podcasts, and then how you had so much success there that you were able to retire, um, maybe even a little earlier than you had thought originally. Um, would you just share with our listeners a little bit on the transition from the collegiate setting to the private sector, and what gave you so much success there? You know, as, as mentioned, I, I probably didn't do a good job of life balance in the collegiate setting. Um, my assistant, who was my best friend at the time, and I had coached him uh, very successfully in powerlifting, came in my office one day and said, can I talk to you? And, I, you know, we never had that kind of an intense relationship. And I said, absolutely. He closed my door. And he said, I said, oh, well, boy, we got something coming here. I said, what's going on? He says, I hate my job. I said, why? He says, well, he goes, I've been keeping our hours and we're never under 70. The last week we did 93. And he says, I don't, I don't feel like I have any life. And I said, what do you want to do? And he says, I don't know. Well, you know, we just resumed doing our 70 hour weeks. That's, we just kept going. So um, when I left Arizona State University, Unfortunately, I was not making the big bucks that these guys are, you know, it's, it's unfathomable 
the amount of money these guys are making these days, you know, because we, we worked for peanuts back in the days. We did it for the love of it. And there were personal trainers in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is right up the road from Arizona State University that were making more than double what I was making, working 70 to 90 hours a week, 26 varsity teams. So I ended up transitioning into private practice, which was a blessing for me because it gave me more time. It gave me more uh, financial reward. And I got to work with an entirely different set of personnel, um, working with a lot of very high profile professional athletes and Olympic athletes. So, uh, you know, in hindsight, you know, the, the whole trip was, was a blessing for me. Yeah, that's, that's an incredible story that you told. I really do think our profession, um, it is, it is kind of messed up how we do get overworked in a lot of ways and underpaid. And it sounds like there was a breaking point for you where you realized the financial freedom and being there to have that time with your family and just to grow yourself as a person, you were right. You were at a point where you said, I need to make a change. And yet you were still able to use at a high level the skill set that God gave you and still make an impact on people's lives. So I think it's an incredible testimony to um, listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit and obeying the calling that God puts on your life. So coach, I wanted to, to ask you next specifically about your journey in the private sector. How have you been successful in that? Um, and I believe it's uh, the Arizona arsenal. I did some consulting there. That was my retirement job. Okay. Um, I had coached a guy named Jim Cope, who was a competitive power lifter. And Jim ended up uh, just a really, really gifted guy, never took any steroids and ended up winning a junior world championship, which is 23 and under set two junior world records, wow. in the deadlift and the total. And um, he ended up his daughter, who was my goddaughter, took up soccer and Jim ended up being the president of the club. And for years, he asked me to come consult with the club. And I just didn't have time. You know, yeah. I was in the private sector, but I was I was so busy with the professional athletes and elite college athletes and Olympians and things. And I finally said I would do a little bit of work and I really liked it. And it was it was really fun for me. So I started consulting, you know, for the soccer club and um, whole new experience, different experience working with developmental athletes as opposed mm -hmm. to working with with just elites. So it, it kind of gave me something in my career I hadn't had up until that point. Yeah, that's that's awesome because I, I feel like in order to be a well-rounded coach, ha kind of having different experiences from different types of athletes. So it sounds like you're at a high level college athlete, then you were working with Olympians, working with all different styles, and now working um, in a different setting where it's more developmental. I mean, what did you learn from that experience and from those experiences as far as like the different caliber of an athlete? To, to me, it's about serving humans. It's about helping humans reach their potential. And I've, I've never cared what anybody's desire or what their goal is. My, my objective is to help them to the very best of my ability to achieve what it is they want to achieve. And um, coaching somebody to win a high school state championship is no different than coaching anybody to win a Super Bowl. It yeah. shouldn't be for us. Wow. Yeah. No, that mindset is is unbelievable. I mean, you're right. We need to be once again and go back to a high degree of excellence in serving and and coach specifically with this idea of serving others. I mean, what has continued to to drive you in that? I mean, after all these years, you're still passionate about serving. You're still passionate about helping. You're passionate about learning. I mean, what is the drive? The energy behind that? Honestly, I was I was blessed, as I mentioned, to be able to retire nine years ago. And and I consider myself retired, but it was when I get off the podcast here, I'm going to go back. I've got in my backyard a four car garage that is um, completely equipped. It looks like a commercial gym. I've gotten a lot of stuff over the years and I'll have a small group going out there. And um, nine years ago, when I realized it, it was possible for me to retire from the full-time grind and driving two hours each day into, you know, into a gym that I was working out of. It, it was the Holy Spirit put on my heart that these are God's children. I've been given success beyond my, what I deserved. And 
I've been given skill set to help change God's children. I need to be changed God's children and not taking all this talent and doing nothing with it. Wow. You know, it reminds me too in scripture when Jesus says, you know, what you do for the least of these, you do unto mm -hmm. me. And children, a lot of times, right, they might not be on national television and getting paid a ton of money, right? But when, I mean, we look at the life of Jesus, I mean, he loved children, right? And so whether you're at the collegiate level, whether you're working in professional athletics, or whether you're in a youth academy or private sector, I mean, there's so many different niches in this field. I mean, who is to say that one person is more important than another in terms of your time and effort and passion that you put into coaching them? Hey guys, sorry to pull you away from the episode for a minute here, but we just wanted to take a moment to stop uh, and just let you guys know about how you can follow us if you want more content from Built to Last. So we're active on Instagram predominantly. We also have a Twitter account. On Instagram, you can find us at Team B2L. And on Twitter, you can find us at Team Built to Last, all one word. Hope you guys are enjoying the episode. Let's get back into it. Um, transitioning a little bit into personnel specifically, I know I can see on the back behind you there, Coach, you have a, a picture of Pat Tillman. And just wanted to go into detail a little bit on, on your relationship with him and and how you've worked with him. And for our listeners, maybe who don't know his story a little bit, would you mind just telling a little bit of the Pat Tillman story and then just your relationship working with him? Pat was an incredible human being. Um, atypical to say the least. I had him as a freshman year player at Arizona State University. And it was kind of interesting. After camp, we go to the northern part of Arizona for a two week camp. Pat was called into the football coach's office and they said, Pat, we're going to redshirt you. He says, you know, I'm, I'm here on scholarship. It's your program. You're free to redshirt me. You're free to do whatever you want, but I'm going to be out of here in four years. I got things to do with my life. So if you want to redshirt me, you know, you might not have that year on the back end. And that, that was Pat. He had things he wanted to do with his life. He was hit so deeply you know, with the 9-11 attacks that he left a $9 million contract offer in pro football to go enlist in the army. When he enlisted, he confided in a friend of mine and myself and said, hey, I'm going to do this. You got to promise not to tell anybody. I want to be the person that's in best shape in boot camp. I need your help. Will you train me? So for a period of two and a half, three months, I had an opportunity to see Pat six days a week. I mean, we three days a week, we took him in strength and conditioning. And then three days a week, we had him in the uh, martial arts dojo, which dojo is Japanese word for training, training place. So we had him in the dojo and um, we spent a lot of time together prior to his leaving and just a, an incredibly in, intense yet wonderful person broke broke my heart literally you know felt my heart break when when he was shot i remember i was was at a karate tournament and at these karate tournaments you have to judge a lot of times i sat in a judge's chair for six hours crying as i'm judging people doing doing karate and then i had to turn around and fight so Needless to say, the guy I ended up fighting in the championships that day was was a little bit irritating to me that day. So I had a lot, I had a, I had a lot of pent up energy that day to to let loose. It's a, it's an unbelievable story of an American hero, and um, you know, coach for just for Pat Tillman's legacy living on, and you having this opportunity to share about your experience with him. I mean, do you have anything that you think? It's like, man, those are some of the intangibles about Pat that you'd want to share about him um, with our listeners. So this is going to sound embellished, but we're, we're in a dojo and there's about 10 of us. And um, you know, Pat was like 182 times the athlete I am, but I had so much more experience with him. So, you know, I could throw Pat and I could throw Pat you know, pretty much where I wanted to. And even though he could do backflips and tumbling passes and things. Um, and then he didn't know much about the mat work when we'd hit the mat. So, you know, we could get patted and choke holds and arm bars and things like that. So at one point he's taking a break and I, I see him chatting with my wife. Now my wife at the time is in her early forties. She was a brown belt in judo. And you could tell they're having a really intense conversation for about 20 minutes. 
And we got done. I was out fighting with other people and we got done. And I said to my wife, you know, you look like you had a great chance to meet with Pat. Did you have a good conversation? She goes, yeah, he wanted to know what he could do to beat you guys. <laughs> and I, I found that fascinating because here's a guy who's a professional football player. That's a freaky athlete. That's strong. That's fast. That's mobile that, you know, physically can do what he wants to do. And he saw the value in a 40 year old brown belt woman that she could help him. There was no ego there. He was willing to learn from anybody that could help him. And I, it, was, it was just dumbfounding to me. He wasn't, you know, he didn't want to ask the other black belts. He wanted to get better and he was going to get better from you know, anybody he could get better from. Kind of a, a life lesson there. Wow. Yeah, you know, one, one of the things with our podcast is that we say a lot is we're, we're trying to encourage, equip, and empower our listeners. And that story that you just shared is so encouraging. And I also feel like um, what you're talking about, this idea of humility, being teachable. I mean, the, the Pat Tillman story, like looking at that and you kind of being a part of that a small in a small way, incredibly impactful way though is so um encouraging as well to me and just a reminder once again listeners like we need to be humble in how we approach things um well coach i would love to hear your journey in karate i mean tell us tell the listeners the backstory with that i mean you got a karate fighting strength coach right here <laughs> yeah you know what we're gonna hide some of the karate stories <laughs> i think um there were there's two Tims. There's good old Christian Tim and serving <laughs> Tim. And then there was karate Tim and karate Tim and Christian Tim have had some battles at times. Um, <laughs> you have to be intense. It, I was fortunate to take that up about 30 years ago and um, had a long, very long, about 25 year competitive career fighting all over the country and meeting a lot of great people. And, um, like a lot of things, the, the more you get to know, the more you realize you don't know. So mm. the karate led to judo and the judo led to jiu-jitsu and the jiu-jitsu led to a Russian art called Sambo. And then to, you know, a lot of what the MMA is, is going on. So it actually, um, put me in a position to learn, to learn a lot of different things and, and develop my, myself, the, the Japanese culture. Um, it is very unyielding. It's very disciplined. It's, it's very tough. And being able to study that and adhere to what they're doing in the dojo, I think made my coaching better as it went along the way. Hmm. So how, how would you say um, specifically, you're just talking about like the discipline and it being an unyielding environment. What would you say would be one takeaway you got from merging that passion of yours with karate and jujitsu and judo and all these other fighting skills that you were kind of learning karate. How, how did you kind of implement that in your coaching specifically? There's an expectation in, in a good dojo with a lot of discipline. Um, it kind of strips you of your identity in a sense that here's what the task is. Here's what the expectations are going to be. You're going to have to meet them. And in my coaching, you know, we always start behind a line. That is absolutely non-negotiable. It's been non-negotiable for 25 years. We don't start on a line. We don't start in front of a line. When we do a drill, I'll, I'll pull out any number here, a 40 yard dash. We don't ever run 39 yards and start coasting. We run 45 yards. Human nature tells somebody to start a couple inches in front of the line and instead of running 40, yard, 40 yards to run 39 yards, that's just human nature. Mm -hmm. And 90 some percent of people will do that instinctively. If we as collectively as a group start behind a line and grow in our discipline and run 45 yards instead of 40 yards, we get better every drill than our opponents are that are running the 39 yards and coasting. Wow. So, um, there's there's a discipline there of expectation. I th I think, and you guys tell me because you're in the field and you're getting after it. I think people meet expectations. I think if you have low expectations, they'll meet it. If you have moderate expectations, they'll meet it. If your expectations are really high, they'll meet it. So having 
you know, a very disciplined environment and not unyielding, not unloving, not unserving, but it's a very disciplined environment where the expectations are consistent and it's a cultural thing, you know, I think is, has, has helped me establish the cultures. And, and, you know, if you look at the judo results this year in the Olympic games, Japan is winning a lot of the, those gold medals. You know, imagine a brother and a sister both won gold medals back to back on the mat in the Olympic games. Yeah. There's a cultural, that's cultural. That's not just genetics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is um, when you talk about like leadership and this idea of expectations is teaching the leaders of the teams, the sport teams we work, we work with to inspect what you expect. And so I a hundred percent affirm what you're saying. I think we as coaches do our teams and our leaders and the people around us, our staff, a disservice if we are not crystal clear with this is the expectation. And at the same time, also saying, I believe in you, not just like try to rise to it. Good luck. It's saying this is the expectation and I believe you can rise to it. So it's giving them that good um, that good reputation to live up to, you know, Justin, like your favorite guy from your favorite book. Um, you could probably say it more clearly, but it's just that idea of like being very, very clear with what the expectation is and then turning around, like you said, and inspecting it, holding them uh, to a high standard and also lovingly, gently, but also firmly and, and with courage saying, I believe in you, you can do it. We are going to get there. We, mm -hmm. we are going to struggle. We are going to be challenged. We are going to face hardship. It's, it's not going to be easy, but we will get there. Yeah. I got to tell you this, this summer, my, you know, and, and I, it's one blessing of being older, you get to see a lot more and do a lot more. And, you know, I've had a lot of blessings in my life. This summer, I had 17 female collegiate soccer players. Actually had a couple from Long Island, one from St. Francis University and one from Long Island University. And uh, we were running, they're on field at 7.15 a.m. We're going to start at 7.30. It started getting hot out here in Phoenix as it does. I said, let's take a, let's take a family vote. Anybody want to start at 6.15? 17 hands went up. Yes. Those are not easy workouts. You know, the, they jokingly call them death workouts. They're hard workouts. They're willing to get up and be on field, ready to go through death workout at 6.15 a.m. And you know, I think it's proof of your point, Justin, is people want their best brought out of them. Mm -hmm. And if it's done in a serving, as Charlie had mentioned, if it's done in a loving and serving and kind way, uh, you, you can create the culture tying into you know, the, the culture that we talked about with the Japanese. You can tie in that culture there. And it's you create an environment that's conducive to success. And every athlete would want that. Yeah, and I love what you're saying there, Coach, and it seems like you're saying that that's what we want, but it's almost like they need someone to help pull it out of them, mm -hmm. and I can see that that's the role that you filled for so many years in this profession, and, you know, to that point, you know, one of my um, favorite quotes that I heard from you in that previous podcast that I listened to, I actually wrote it down here because it meant so much to me, and as soon as I, I listened to it, uh, I run our internship at Hofstra, I went to our interns, and I played this uh, little 20-second snippet from the podcast for them, too, because I wanted them to hear it. Um, but I just want to read it for our listeners here, too. This is a quote from Coach Tim McClellan um, from the Samson uh, Strength Coach podcast. It says, someone once said, you can't coach heart, and that's all I want to coach. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. I can coach heart, and it's not being braggadocious. But to me, if you can help somebody with their heart, you can change their character. If you can change their character, you can change their effort. If you can change their effort, you have a chance of winning. If the character is lower, the effort is lower. The chance of winning is then going to be lower. So long story short, I just think it's a matter of creating the right relationship and walking side by side with somebody. Coach, what, what led you to share that? You know, it's kind of funny because I one time was being interviewed and I said, I said you, people say you can't coach heart. That's all I want to coach is heart. And I got ridiculed for it. But I mean, what you look at the great leaders, think about, and I, I love the study of leadership. Alexander the Great had people, 
now, mind you, these are all away games for the Macedonians back in the day. They didn't fight on their home turf. Had people march 140 to 160 miles in four days. So that's more than a marathon a day carrying battle armor. They weren't wearing Air Jordans at the time. 60,000 people fighting 600,000. So, yeah. hey, Justin, you want to you go walk 40 miles a day for four days, and at the end of that, your reward is you're going to have to fight 10 guys, and you either die or you beat those 10. But he somehow instilled in them a confidence and a heart, which is why I like the study of leadership, that they – had to pursue greatness and wanted to pursue greatness and did pursue greatness. They went 11 years undefeated. Think about that. You know, just an, an incredible, incredible outcome. And I think uh, John Maxwell said, everything rises and falls on leadership. And my, my concern with a lot of the coaches is they coach the way they were coached or they coached with gimmicks or they have little mind games they want to play mm -hmm. instead of being effective leaders and great leaders and servant leaders yeah i mean talking about leadership how would you define leadership influence i'm going with john maxwell's yep influence i love but, that but and now then, so then yeah it, that's ahead. influence leadership is influence but adolf hitler was a leader you cannot deny that he was a leader he had influence mm -hmm. yeah I mean, he took his, his entire country to war. They were getting beat down at the end of that war, something fierce. They kept fighting. He wasn't a good leader. A good leader establishes a positive outcome that otherwise would not have happened. Mm -hmm. He was not a good leader. He did not establish a positive outcome. He established an outcome that wouldn't have happened otherwise, but it sure wasn't positive. So, so to you, I think good, good leadership yeah. is is you know something that, we all should strive for and I need to get better at it. So that was going to be my follow up question is how do you specifically, if you're talking about good leadership, I wrote this down, good leadership is influence for a positive outcome. How do you take that definition, that working definition and instill it in yourself to grow your leadership? What are things that you do? I'll give you a great example. I had an opportunity to meet a soccer coach, sit down and have lunch with a soccer coach for an hour. Mm -hmm. I said, how do you like your collegiate strengths coach? He says, I love him. I said, what's his name? He says, Justin. I said, would you get me in touch with him? He said, yeah. So Justin and I started communicating, started talking, and I could tell he was really sharp. And I said, you know what? This guy's really sharp. I can learn from this guy. So... You know, and this was a Holy Spirit thing. I was asked by a guy named Ken Contour, who runs the Conditioning Press magazine. He was the former president of the National Strength and Conditioning Association. And I've known Ken for decades. And he says, hey, would you be interested in writing an article? I said, you know what? I've got the perfect guy to co-author this with. So I contacted Justin. He was game. And he wrote up his draft of notes. I wrote up my draft of notes. I looked at his and I said, holy cow, is it, here's this young guy that's really sharp. I need to learn from him. So it, it was an issue of me actively seeking betterment. And I, I'll tell you what, the results were incredible. I, I mean, I learned a lot during this article. It's like, you know, here I, I reached out to a young guy that probably is half my age, but seven or eight times smarter than I am, yeah. you know, a talented well, young guy and reaped a lot of benefits from it. Yeah. I mean, once again, we go back to this theme that we're hearing is, is humility. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. Charlie. Putting it's on like, humility. If, if we took like stats on this podcast and added up how many times coaches use the words learn and humility and things like that, it's, it's incredible. And coach, I've been waiting to ask you this one too. It's like, when we had that phone call, I felt almost awkward with you asking me so many questions about me when I feel like I should be the one learning from you. And so I just, for, for our listeners out there, for myself even, what, how do you stay so humble? I mean, you've accomplished so much in the profession. How do you keep ego from creeping in? Just what, what drives you in that area of your life from the humility perspective? I don't know anything. I mean, you know, <laughs> what, what, 
Justin, back when I was your age, if I wanted to learn something scientific, I went, I went to the, after working a 12 hour day, I, I drove my bicycle over to the library, walked up to the third floor, got the card catalog out, found the number <laughs> eight, six, nine, four, seven, three, went and looked for that book and started sat down reading book. If I saw something that I liked, I had to take my dimes down to the copy machine and make copies of it. You guys have the whole world at your fingertips. It's amazing. And it's so cool to see the changes that guys like you and Charlie have brought into this profession. You know, they'd like what we're doing right now. You know, it's just, you're changing the profession immensely. And, and there's, the more, you know, the more you realize you don't know, there's so mm. much that I don't know and opportunity to learn from guys like you sitting in the comfort of my office is it's like a foreign concept. It's amazing <laughs> for me. You know, well, you know what's cool too, Coach. I'm sorry, I was going to add no, this. Too. Go ahead. Just, yeah. One thing I'm picking up from Coach, you know, just those daily disciplines of doing hard things or doing things that aren't comfortable all the time. Nowadays, everything is so microwave. It's like, oh, we have an app for this, or we have a convenient way of doing that, and it's like, just like you said, riding your bike. As simple, simple as that. You didn't, you weren't driving a car, right? You were riding your bike to the library. Then you had to get the catalog number. And there were so many steps to get what you wanted. I mean, nowadays, like you said, we have the internet, so there's no excuse. I mean, we should have more than ever at this point. Um, but just bringing back in ways, like even with our athletes, if we can put them uh, in situations where they have to do things, sometimes maybe the hard way, sometimes just maybe more the blue collar way, sometimes just ways of doing things we've gotten so far away from. I think that's a good lesson there for a lot of people to take from. Um, and it seems like throughout your career, um, and even still, like you said, it's just that humility is still with you. And you know yeah. what? I, I wish I was a young guy like, like you and Charlie here. I really do. But I'm, I'm very, very grateful that I've seen so much change in the profession. You know, one of the things um, that was mentioned to me, there was a guy named Trip Hedrick, was the swim coach at Iowa State University, very successful, never had any blue chippers, but always had good squads. And he was a competitive master swimmer at a very, you know, world record type of guy. And he looked at me, and this is probably, I was consulting at Iowa State with the wrestling program maybe 15 years ago, 12 years ago. And he goes, You know what's missing in the collegiate weight room today? I said, What? And he says, Sweat. <laughs> you know, oh, and I, I look, I've got a, a manual from the Anaheim Ducks, 1990, one of the players. I was looking through that the other day and you go, wow, did these guys do a high volume back then? And, you know, I got to live that era. I got to live the high volume, you know, kind of non-scientific era. And I get to live this low volume, very scientific era. And pick and choose from all those things. Hey guys, just wanted to talk to you for a brief moment here. Uh, we'll be right back into the show, but if you've been enjoying these shows and the ministry has blessed you, really, if God has blessed you through this ministry, uh, if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to give a rating or a review, whether it's on iTunes uh, or however you watch the show, it would just mean so much to us. Uh, beyond that, it also helps this episode get out to more people uh, and just spread the message of the gospel and grow this ministry. Yeah, I mean, I guess it really comes back down to um, realizing that the knowledge is going to continue to expand and grow. And so we have to stay hungry and humble. And I love what you're doing with just uh, how you explained. Guys, this is a coach who's been in the field for 40 plus years and he's reaching out. He's initiating Notice, notice the, the, the act here. It's proactive. He's not just being reactive and waiting. He is proactively reaching out. And next thing you know, he's adding value to others through this article. So, I mean, that's just an incredible testimony, I think, to the example of how to stay humble. So, Coach, my, my last question for you before we get into the fast finishers is just what would be your, your biggest advice to some of our listeners who are wanting to grow in their faith? I mean, You've been a veteran in the field. You're, you're a veteran in the faith. What would be your biggest advice for, for those that want to grow in their faith and really take it to that next level? You know, I, I, I think if in my, in my mind, and, you know, I'm, I'm no rocket scientist here, but in my mind, we're, we're asking something of those that we're asked to lead. We're asking them to be disciplined. We're asking them to try hard. We're asking mm -hmm. them to endure hardships set goals. There's so many inherent values in sports that we're preaching. 
we need to apply those not only in pursuit of our coaching and leadership abilities, but also in pursuit of our faith. It's mm -hmm. a daily discipline. And, you know, it's, it's the same thing. It, it's, you know, we should have high expectations of ourselves that we have of our athletes and we should have high expectation of ourselves as leaders, as coaches, as friends, as, you know, husbands of, you know, twins soon to be. And, um, you know, we, within our, our walk with Jesus, yeah. I, I mean, you know, at, at the end of the day, when something goes wrong in somebody's life or somebody needs life change, you get down and pray to God. You don't get down and pray to a you work 45 pound plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, there's bigger, there's bigger issues in a barbell. The barbell has been amazing experience for all of us. It's, it's a tool, but there's just so much more that's so much more important and bigger in life and, and pursuing those things that can give you peace of heart and, you know, there, there'll be days when three of us are going to be in heaven and we're going to be talking about this podcast and laughing and having a good time. <laughs> I said, God, you guys were half my age. I was so old. What did you <laughs> want to talk to this old guy? He's older than dirt. Coach, I, I feel like we could go forever here. And I just want to keep listening to you share and, and talk some more. But um, usually we keep these around 45 minutes. So we'll get into our fast finishers here. Um, three questions that we finish every show with. What's your favorite book? Fair bit Bible verse or story from the Bible, and how do you define success? And so we'll start with the first one. We'd love to hear your favorite book, Coach. Bible. Love it. Simple it's as that. Got, it's got to be. Well, you know what? If you do the Bible right, life's going to be a whole lot better for you. Yeah. So unquestionably, as for, far as a favorite scripture, I struggle with this one. I'd like to get your take on this, you guys, because Second Timothy says all scriptures God breathed. Mm -hmm. So how do you say, I really like these words that God put down, but I don't like these as much. <laughs> right. <laughs> I struggle right. with that. But that being said, Joshua 1, 9, Jeremiah 29, 11, some, some one that's never anybody's favorites, Matthew 5, 41, if asked to walk a mile, walk two, um, Colossians 3, 23, do everything you do work, uh, as if you're working for the Lord, mm -hmm. not for man and Galatians 6, 2. So if I had to pick favorites as a, the bad human being that I am, those are my favorite of God's words. Not that I don't like the rest of them. <laughs> That's they're my favorites. I've never, I've never heard it that way before. And no surprise there, Coach, you picked the Bible verse that most other people is not a fan favorite, and it's about walking the extra mile. So Absolutely. no surprise. No well, that's for all of us, Justin, you and Charlie yeah. and I, you know, and, and really Amen. as accountability brothers, we need, you know, we should hold each other to it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I love it. And then coach, just to finish up here, how would you define success? I, I, I'm going to go back to Aeneas Williams, you know, the NFL hall of famer that, that's an ordained minister. And uh, when he, did his talk in his Hall of Fame ceremony. He had the whole crowd chanting, end empty. Empty your tank. Empty your tank in serving others. Empty your tank in, in seeking knowledge. I mean, empty your tank to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Give him your whole heart. I, I just, it's a hard thing to do. It's something we ask others to do. It's something we should be doing. Unbelievable. Wow. I've Love never it. heard of definition like that. That man. was awesome. It, it empty yourself for the Lord. Well, coach, we generally try to finish our episodes with doing a prayer. And, um, you know, one of the things that I would love to do is pray for you. But before I do that, if any of our listeners want to reach out to you, what would be the best way to contact you or to get in touch with you? Email Tim at strength and peace.com. Okay. I'd awesome. be glad to help anybody to the best of my ability. But awesome. forewarn everybody, I'm not that young, smart guy like you guys are. I'm just an old <laughs> dinosaur. But you, you are responsive. You will, you will return emails yeah, at, and right it's, away. And, yeah, and it's an email and phone call worthwhile, guys. You should definitely reach out. Yeah. Well, hey, Coach. Uh, so besides, you know, praying for, um, thanking Jesus for all his blessings for us, that was one of the things you had filled out on the form. Is there anything else that 
that our listeners, that Justin and I can be praying for you right now, specifically in your life? You know what? I, I would like to thank Jesus for this day. This day is a gift. This day is not something that I could give to myself. It's not something I can give to others. It's something I have to receive as a free gift. And um, I would like to thank the Lord for being the Lord. I, I would hope that the Lord will continue to help others seek him and seek his ways. I would like to thank the Lord for you and Justin, I mean, my new friends. I mean, what a blessing for me. I get to sit here as, as you know, an old relic and, and hobnob with two young upcoming guys that are getting after it and doing great things and creating a ministry here and creating better athletes and better people and serving. So I'm, I'm thankful for all those things. So I, I, I love prayers of Thanksgiving. Wow. Okay, man, this is going to be awesome. Well, let's do it. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for, for Coach Tim McClellan and his humility to be on the show and just to be able to share God, his journey. I thank you, Lord, that today is the greatest gift you've ever given, Lord. It's the greatest gift because you've given us life through Jesus and in the resurrection, Lord, in the power of the cross. And so I thank you for that. I pray that you would bless Coach McClellan and his um, his ministry, Lord, bless him with his wife and his family, Lord. I pray that you would bless him in the different uh, opportunities he has to lead others and to coach people. And God, I pray that you would continue to just grow and bless the ministry of Built to Last and, and a special blessing on, on me and Justin and Andrew, our, our article writer. I pray, God, that you would continue to help us to foster a community of strength coaches and coaches in general um, and believers, Lord, that can encourage, equip, and empower one another and, and just to live out our faith, God, I pray, Lord, just like Coach McClellan was saying at the end, help, help us to empty ourselves for your glory, to seek your kingdom first, and to trust you and to know you and to love you with all of our heart, all of our, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, God, everything in our being. Help us just to love you and to pursue you and to sprint after you. Lord, thank you again for this, this awesome podcast and this amazing man of God. And I pray that you would bless him and the rest of his legacy um, the rest of his life, God, and his journey. And so uh, we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Built to Last podcast, where we encourage, equip, and empower coaches to live out their core values where they live, work, and wherever they build relationships. Have a blessed day, striving to build lasting impact.